So we're going to get a little bit of the teaching at the beginning, but as it goes on, uh, I hope that it's something that can be practical that you can take away with you. Um, so that way uh, it'll help uh, change uh, the way that you study God's Word. So Revelation chapter 1 and look at verse 4. So it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Notice there that the spirits has a capital S, capital S. Jump down now to verse 20. It says, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So you'll notice that there's a lot of sevens going on in the book of, Re in the book of Revelation. So we saw the seven spirits of God at first. You also see that there are seven stars. We're not really going to hit on those too much, but notice too that there are seven golden candlesticks. Now the picture of this, which is what we're going to mainly be focusing on tonight, is that the seven golden candlesticks we saw in verse 20, those are the seven churches uh, that are uh, mentioned there. It says at the end of verse 20, which thou sawest are the seven churches. But notice that each candlestick is there to hold something. Right. And you'll notice what that represents. So go ahead now and go to Revelation 4 and verse 5. Revelation 4 and verse 5. We're just setting the stage right now. You'll see how it comes together when you look at both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you see how uh, what is in the Old Testament pictures what actually you find now to be revealed in the New Testament. So Revelation 4 and then verse 5. It says, And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So notice that the candlesticks are the churches, but the lamps of fire, the seven lamps of fire, are the seven spirits of God. So each of these candlesticks, the seven golden candlesticks, they are all there because, as the name implies, it's a candle. So there's going to be a lamp of fire on each one of those. All right, so you see a picture here of what is before the throne of God. Now speaking about the throne of God, go ahead now and turn to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, you'll see that what God was telling Moses in the Old Testament, I know when we read some of those chapters in, in the Old Testament and we're trying to figure out what's, what's the purpose behind God, including all of that, why did the Holy Spirit have Moses write this in the book of Genesis and Exodus? What we see is that it actually pictures something that is spiritual. So Exodus 25 and look at verse 31. It says, And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, and the beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowels, his knobs, his knops, which that's another word for knob, and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds with a knop and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch with a knop and a flower, so in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knops and their flowers. And there shall be a knop under two branches of the same, and a knop under two branches of the same. Did I read that one? Yeah and a knob under two branches of the same, according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knobs and their branches shall be of the same. All it shall be, shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps, remember in Revelation we read about the lamps of fire, seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. So, we know that the earthly tabernacle that's described here pictures the heavenly tabernacle. Now, when you look at what's used to light the candles, this sheds some light, no pun intended, on the seven spirits of God. Go back at verse 6 of the same chapter, Exodus 25, verse 6. It says, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil, and for sweet incense. 
So notice here, oil. Oil is a type of the Holy Spirit, which you see throughout the Scriptures. Also look at Exodus 27 and verse 20. Exodus 27 and verse 20 says, And thou shalt command the children of Israel that they bring the pure oil, olive, beaten for the light, to cause the lamp to burn always. So notice that the oil, that is what's actually used for the lamp of fire. Now, for people who don't know about the Holy Spirit and oil and their relation with one another, go to 1 Samuel chapter 16. 1 Samuel chapter 16. So oil is used for anointing throughout the Bible, but it's also used as a picture or a type of the Holy Spirit. So look at 1 Samuel 16 and verse 13. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. Now the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. So what you see there is that when David is physically anointed with physical oil, it's actually a type or a picture of a spiritual transaction that's taking place. That's when the Holy Spirit of God comes upon him. So you see that oil and the Holy Spirit are very much tied together, and oil is exactly what's used to light the lamps of fire on the golden candlestick. Now, let's go to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. Now, most people in here know about this passage, and it's fascinating uh, when you look at it and what the Bible says. Now, when we're trying to figure out what the seven spirits of God are or what they might represent, the answer is found in Isaiah 11 and verse 2. Notice it says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So notice here at the very beginning you have the Spirit of the Lord mentioned, but then everything after that is pairs. All of, it are, all of them are connected to one another. Now when you look at the golden candlestick, what's interesting is you have a single candlestick in the middle, and then you have each of them connected with one another. So just like Isaiah 11.2, you see that pictured with the different spirits of God connected with one another as shown with the candlestick. Good, now, I didn't, I don't want anybody in here to think that I came up with this on my own, so I'm going to give credit where credit's due. If you have a Ruckman reference Bible, go to page 16, or you can just write this down, we won't go there, but you can see on page 1689, Dr. Ruckman even makes the point and, and draws the connection between the seven spirits of God and the seven lamps of fire on the golden candlestick. So it's just, it, it's amazing uh, that he was able to discover that and that we're all able to uh, see that through the Bible as well. Amen. Now, notice that they're mentioned in pairs. Now, I'm not 100% sure about this part. This would be something uh, I wouldn't teach as doctrine, but it would be something I would encourage all of you to look into if you're curious about it. There does also seem to be a possible connection with the 7,000 years of history. So when you start all the way to the left, what's the first one? Knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So you see that at the beginning. And then Dr. Ruckman again also talks about when you count one, two, three, four, you get to the Spirit of the Lord, and the Lord Jesus Christ came at 4,000 years of human history. And then when you look at the very end with the seven, the fear of the Lord, I mean, the millennial kingdom is going to be when the Lord Jesus Christ is physically here reigning on the earth. There's going to be a fear of the Lord that's never existed before on this earth when Jesus Christ is reigning with a rod of iron. But I don't know about the other ones, so maybe if someone else wants to look into that more, I'd be really fascinated to see if you could find something. But that's just something that I wanted to throw out there. Now, also look at, so hold your place in Isaiah 11. That's our main text, but go back to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 13. So notice it says in Revelation 1.13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Well, the midst of the seven candlesticks is the middle. So that would be right here in the middle. One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. 
So notice there that the center one, the one that's in the middle, that's connected with the Spirit of the Lord, is also connected with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a divine connection of the middle one that's holding the rest of them together. All right. So now what we're going to get into a little bit is going into the different spirits of God and what they represent. Now, something that I think is fascinating is that science recently has actually caught up to what the Bible said all along, written in the book of Isaiah. So this is B.C. 713 is what I have in, in my Bible. But you'll notice recently that they've come to some interesting conclusions about our own human spirit. So if you notice, we'll start uh, on this side. So if you notice, knowledge, counsel, and wisdom, you see a lot of people associate that stuff with the, wait, wrong one, sorry, with the left side of your brain. You hear people who talk about you're either left brain dominant or you're thinking with the left side of your brain or the right side of your brain. Well, the left side is associated with things such as um, reason. So this is something. So the left side is associated with reason. You also have thinking. I know I do not have the best handwriting, so please bear with me. And then lastly, you see it associated with science, the more scientific part of your brain. But then on the other side, what you see here is what they talk about the right side of your brain, which is connected to emotion, feeling, and you could say art. Now think about it today. When you go to school and get a degree, you get a bachelor of what or what? Art or science, right? It's one of the two because even the world recognizes that there's two parts going on here. So whereas the left side, it says, come let us reason together. You have the reason part. Then you have an emotional part to it. So if we're honest, when we heard the gospel, there is a logical or a, um, a reasonable component to it, but there is also an emotional component to it when you realize what Jesus Christ did for you. Just like with thinking, there are facts that are presented you're actually able to think about, but then there's also a feeling that goes along with it. Now, obviously, salvation is not a feeling. That's not what I'm saying. However, just like it says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus... So that's like doing something and believe in thine heart. Yeah. So you have different components, but it's all connected together with the gospel. Right. And then, like I said, science and art. Uh, that's something that we say in the military a lot. They'll talk about uh, the science of war versus the art of war. Or you may have the science of leadership versus the art of leadership. So somebody who's too far to one side with the science of leadership will just say they know all the right things of what to do, what to say. But if they can't actually have an art to it and know how to read the room and deal with different people, then it's not going to work out. So notice that there are two sides connected here. Good, and just like the Bible says, you have these on this side, knowledge, counsel, and wisdom. And then you have understanding, might, and the fear of the Lord. So fear, that's an emotion. That's the only one on here that we would say is an emotion. It's connected with this side. And so there's going to be a lot of overlap and mutual support between the different attributes uh, that are mentioned here. Uh, but you'll definitely notice that there is a distinction between both sides. All right. So make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay. So first off, we are going to look at wisdom and understanding. The reason why we're going to do it, we're going to start in here. And then we're going to connect the two with each other. So notice we have wisdom and understanding. So with wisdom... What you have is connected with the mind, and then you have the heart on this side. All right, let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. So from here on, we're going to be turning to a bunch of different places. Uh, if you don't get there in time, that's fine. Just write it down. But Ezekiel chapter 28. And it's incredible how the Bible connects all of these together, and it's, it's just mind-blowing when you see how much God allows them to be connected together throughout His Word. So Ezekiel 28 and verse 17. So if you know anything about Ezekiel 28, this is talking about Lucifer. So this is the devil before he fell. So notice it says, Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, 
thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason, which we just talked about, of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before things, before, before kings, that they may behold thee. So notice here, when you have wisdom at the very beginning, you can see that that can be corrupted. So just like with Lucifer, it talked about an error with, the, with his wisdom because he didn't have the right heart. So his wisdom was thrown off because of something, the iniquity that was found in him. Go now to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. And then look at verse 9. So Revelation 17, talking about the great whore, Mystery Babylon. It says in verse 9, And here is the what? Mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Something I think is very interesting, too, is are those mountains, what do mountains do? They block stuff, and they prevent light from getting out. So those seven mountains, what Mystery Babylon is doing today is it's, it's affecting people's ability to see what the truth is, and it's blocking the light of the gospel and of the Holy Spirit to other people. All right, let's go now to understanding. So understanding, Job 38. Job chapter 38. Job 38, and then we'll look at verse 36. It says, Who hath put wisdom in the inward parts, or who hath given understanding to the heart? So notice, wisdom is connected with understanding, understanding connected there with the heart. Next, go to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Like I said, there's, there's a lot of teaching at the beginning of this, but don't worry, at the end, there, there's going to be some practical application. Amen? On, so we're not, we're not going to let the knowledge puff us up. We're actually going to do something with it. All right, so Proverbs 3 and verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So this, again, they're very much connected, understanding and the heart. And then finally, we'll go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of verses that I'm skipping, and you'll see a lot of these attributes mentioned together all over the Bible. So I'm just picking some of the highlights that stuck out for me, but I'd encourage you to look up all these verses as well and, and see just, just how connected they are throughout the Bible. Ephesians 4.18. So, talking about the old man, it says, Having their understanding, right here, darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. So because their heart's blind, their understanding gets darkened. So notice the connection here. So on one side with wisdom, you have something that's more associated with the mind. And on the other side, you have um, understanding, which is more associated with the heart. And I actually did that backwards. Sorry. So that's going to be the top one. So if you could basically categorize these three right here, this would fall under what you'd call the mind or the left side of your brain. Over here, you have the heart or the right side over here, more of the emotional part. All right. Now let's go to, let's look at the next two. So we have counsel and might. So go to Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12. It's amazing how, like I said, the world is catching up and science is catching up because of our own minds bearing witness to God's Spirit and how He's put um, and how the Spirit comes from God. Obviously, there's the Holy Spirit, but the Spirit goes into God who gave it uh, when someone dies. So it's just amazing to see how the Bible had this all right, and which we know to be true, and then today they're just finding out stuff and it's all agreeing with the Bible. They just don't want to give it credit. All right, Job chapter 12, verse 13. It says here, With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. So notice here, wisdom and strength, and then counsel and understanding. 
So understanding is there. You have counsel over there also with the wisdom. But if you notice too, strength is the word that's used, yeah. but you could also say might. So might's included in there too. So notice you have all four of these mentioned together. So counsel, wisdom, understanding, and might or strength. When I try to look up all the instances of the word might in the Bible, it gets kind of hard because the word might can be used as in like you might do something. Uh, so that one's a little bit trickier, but strength, we all know that strength and might uh, are, are synonyms. Um, so that also illustrates the point. Go now to Psalm 107. Psalm 107. All right, Psalm 107, and then look at verse 11. This is, this is a very eye-opening verse, and it says a lot about the Bible issue today. It says, Because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. So notice here, the counsel of the Most High in that part has to do with people rebelling against the words of God. So notice, who are the, who, who's the biggest opponent today for the words of God being preserved in the King James Bible. It's the scholars, the textual critics, the people who are too much focused and wrapped up in their own minds. So because their minds are off balance and they're, and they're messed up with their mind, then notice here that they rebelled against the words of God. It's an issue in their heart, but it's also an issue in their mind. Notice too uh, that... Yeah, so uh, you just notice that as well. There's, there's an issue on multiple levels. Uh, let's go now to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 and verse 24. So this one's short but sweet. Uh, unlike the rest of the chapter, Psalm 119 is an amazing chapter. All about the word of God and the words of God. But notice in Psalm 119, 24, it says, Thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So the testimonies of God, what you see when you read throughout Psalm 119, Psalm 119 is the psalmist is constantly making references to the testimonies of God, the commandments of God, the word of God, the words of God. The words that we have right here in our King James Bible, those are our counselors. That is counsel. That's what God gave us with his Holy Spirit to give us counsel. So notice that the words of God themselves are our counselors. And then finally, look at Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs chapter 12. Proverbs 12, and then look at verse 5. So the thoughts of the righteous are right. So thoughts, you have that like thinking connected with the mind. But the counsels of the wicked are deceit. So again, it's showing you that the counsel of the wicked, it's an issue with what are they filling their mind with? What are they thinking about? They're trying to rely on human reason, human thinking, and what science has to say instead of what the Bible actually has to say. All right, now looking at might, looking at might, go to Job chapter 9. Job chapter 9. Job, Psalms, and Proverbs are especially rich with all of these. It's, it's a blessing to read through it. All right, Job chapter 9 and verse... Four. Job 9 4. It says, He is wise in heart and mighty in strength, who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered. The point here is that might is connected with the heart. So, whereas we saw counsel, the counsel of God being connected with your mind, that's the way that he ministers to your mind. With might, the might, that's connected with the heart. That's connected with the heart. And I forgot to write this down at the beginning, uh, so that's my bad. But if you notice, you see here with counsel, you get teaching. And then with might, we get our strength. And you see that there's power in preaching. So notice, you have teaching, which is aimed at the mind. But then you also need to have preaching, which is aimed at the heart. That's good. Amen. So notice, we need both of them. So just like we need our mind ministered to, we also need our heart ministered to. We get teaching for our mind, we get preaching for the heart. If you miss one, then you're going to get all in balance. These candlesticks are all going to go down on one side. These ones are all going to raise up because you're out of balance at that point. 
And that's, that's mainly what the practical application is going to be, but not going to spoil that yet. All right. Um, okay. And then uh, finally look at Matthew. Not finally. Finally for just might. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. So Matthew 14, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, and then look at verse, well, we'll start in verse 1. So uh, chapter Matthew 14, verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Notice here that there's a connection between might and works which is going to segue into our last point here. But might is connected with works. Well, what was Jesus doing during this time? And what was John the Baptist doing? They were going around preaching. They were preaching, and then they were doing mighty works. And so the might being connected with the works, we see that there is power and might with preaching. Um, so then that leads us to knowledge and fear of the Lord. So on this side, you have doctrine... And then on this side, you have practice. All right. Doctrine and practice. So you see here that there are two parts. This, is, this all has to do with the same seven spirits of God, but you can obviously see that there are different things on different sides that are connected with one another that show how we can be balanced in our own Christian lives as well. So let's go to uh, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 and verse 28. So this is very eye-opening. So most of us are familiar with Romans 1, especially towards the end of the chapter. But look what it says. It says... And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. So they didn't want to retain God in their knowledge. So then guess what? Reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now look at 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8 and then verse 1. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we have all knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Knowledge is the thing that puffeth up. Remember from Ezekiel 28, with wisdom being connected with Lucifer, and that had to do with his sin. So we see that knowledge puffeth up, but what edifieth? Charity, which is your heart. That's an emotion. So that's where you see the balance. Because if you go too far on one side with the knowledge but you don't balance it out with charity in this case, but that, again, is tied to the heart, then you're going to be off balance and you're not going to be able to please the Lord. And then finally, we'll see the fear of the Lord. Pretty obvious, fear is an emotion. Look at Proverbs chapter 1. Most of us probably have this verse memorized, but we'll still turn there. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So guess what? The fear of the Lord here, connected right here to knowledge on that side. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. I, I would dare say instruction is like preaching. So again, you have someone uh, disregarding both sides. Let's now go to 2 Chronicles 17. 2 Chronicles 17. So 2 Chronicles 17, and then look at verse 10. It says, And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah. So look what happens. So when the fear of the Lord is present, what happened? It says, So that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. So them choosing to not make war was because of the fear of the Lord. So what you see there is the fear of the Lord impacts what you do, your practice. The fear of the Lord caused them not to go to war. 
Look now at Job 28. You see this also in Job 28. Job 28, and then look at verse 28. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. So you have wisdom and understanding connected at the end of both of those phrases. So then that means you have the fear of the Lord being connected with departing from evil, your practice, what you choose to do. Right. All right? So, you see that both of those are connected. And then we'll look at Acts chapter 9. This will be the last uh, passage for this. Acts chapter 9. Acts 9 and then verse 31. And I'm just kind of, I know I'm just driving the point home, but I want you to see it so that way you can actually see that this is what the Bible connects with itself. It says in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So it says the churches, the compliment that it gives the church, the churches that are here, is they were walking, so that's doing something, their practice, in the fear of the Lord. I also think it's pretty awesome, too, how notice you have fear and comfort connected together. Right. So walking in the fear of the Lord, you get the comfort Amen. of the Holy Ghost. Amen. What do those both minister to? Your heart. Yeah. Comfort, that's an emotion, right? The fear of the Lord, God says, if you fear me, then guess what? You're going to get comfort. I'm going to give you an emotion back. You give God that emotion, fear, he'll give you back that emotion of comfort. That's good. Amen. All right. Now, okay, go now to 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. So when we tie all of this together, just like with the center right here, you have on these sides, it deals with the mind, which receives teaching, and that's how you learn doctrine. But then you also have the heart, which has to do with preaching and practice, that affecting what you do. But all of this falls under the umbrella of, of what the Bible calls your spirit. So if you ever want to know what your spirit is, we know that we have a body, a soul, and a spirit. Body, that's pretty obvious. We're all looking at each other right now, our physical bodies. We can see the soul. It talks about it having a shape in the Bible. But the spirit, that one's a little bit more mysterious. You have to really study it more to figure out what the spirit is. Well, if you would like a visual representation of the spirit, this is it right here that the Bible provides you. Within your spirit, you have your heart and you have your mind. And in order to not get imbalanced one side to another, you need the Spirit of the Lord in the middle so that way you don't get imbalanced. The Holy Spirit is what balances out your human spirit. All right, so 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. It says, For by one Spirit... Are we all baptized into one body? Okay, but wait a second. I thought there were seven spirits of God. Well, guess what? There's still one spirit because all of these together, God still considers it one spirit. The spirit of the Lord is what's holding it all together. So there's still one spirit, but just like with the Godhead, the Trinity, we might not be able to fully understand that. Just like there's three in one, well, there's also seven in one. And, that, and it shows you that God, so I, I've heard it said that God's reasoning never contradicts our human reasoning, but it usurps it. So if this is what the Bible says, then we believe what it says, even if we might not understand it fully. Right. Good, amen. Um, now let's look at Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. So Ephesians 4 and verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. So I just say these verses just to say that there is still one spirit. However, within the one spirit, right here in the middle, this one doesn't have something to balance it out. The Holy Spirit's there in the middle. That's what the anchor is, and he's the one that holds all of it together. So it's still one spirit, but there are also seven spirits in the book of Revelation. So hopefully that somewhat makes sense. If, even if it doesn't make sense, we still believe it. Amen. All right. 
So for, okay, let's go to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Now, moving into the practical application. For my visual, you will notice that we were over here for most of this teaching, but now we're going to move over here lest we get imbalanced. Amen? So, Proverbs 11.1. 1. Proverbs 11.1, 1, it says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And you see this visually illustrated with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord, balancing out your own spirit. So notice something. When people get presented the gospel, you'll usually find that they reject it, the ones who reject it, because obviously people can accept the gospel, but the ones who reject it, it's usually because of some imbalance to one side. When you witness to atheists, they will go heavy on this side because it contradicts their reason and their thinking and what science says. But then you talk to some other people who are imbalanced on this side, and they say, I don't understand how a loving God could send people to hell. So you notice that it's an imbalance in their spirit that causes them to reject the gospel. And the only way that you're going to have your mind and your heart balanced is through the Spirit of the Lord. This is your human spirit, but you need the Spirit of the Lord right here to keep each side perfectly balanced. Okay, so practical application is simply, what are you doing with your knowledge? So for us as Bible believers, this is, so I'll hit one side of the aisle first, but we got to hit ourselves, all right? So on one side, you have the more emotional side of Christianity. You have the evangelicals, charismatics, other churches that completely forsake right doctrine and true Bible teaching at the expense of emotion and at the expense of how they feel. So you have an imbalance in a lot of Christian churches today on that side, and that's why when they're trying to be used by the Lord, because there's that imbalance, because the Holy Spirit, they haven't yielded to the Holy Spirit and they haven't submitted to Him, then what you're going to see is that affects their Christian living and their ability to please the Lord. It's because they're imbalanced. They, the, the churches that don't teach doctrine, because we know that doctrine divides, they just want everybody to feel welcome and for everybody to feel good. All of that is where they get imbalanced too far on this side. Now, time to hit us. A lot of times we can unfortunately go too far on this side. And I get it. When you're learning the Bible, especially when you get shown Bible-believing dispensational truth, you absolutely increase in knowledge, which is good because you're learning about the Lord. Right. However, if we don't balance that on this side, then we can run into some trouble. I, and, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in here. I, have, I look back now, and unfortunately, because I had such a zeal for the knowledge part of the Bible, trying to explain the King James Bible to someone, because I got too imbalanced on showing what I know versus my heart for that person and just wanting that person to believe the truth, then I became imbalanced. And I, I look back and I, I get saddened by that because I could have presented it in a better way if I had balanced out my knowledge about the words of God with my heart and caring about the person more. So. We see that too. You also see that, um, I won't talk about them too much, but you know, you look at Calvinists, which I don't know how you can have a heart if you think that God predestines people to go to hell and burn forever. So they, like, they completely tear this part out and go just with that. But then they also tear that one out because it also doesn't make any sense. So that one, I don't even know. Um, so, so you see that as well. But, but again, speaking to us, because it's easy to preach against other people, other churches, other denominations, but we need to focus on, you know, what's wrong with us. That's right. I see a lot of us, sometimes we get too far on this side. And so that's something that needs to be balanced out right. with the heart. And the only way it can be balanced Amen. is right here through yielding and submitting to the Holy Spirit. Okay. And, and also on that, so I know that we have some people online that are watching. Well, it's good that you want to know about the Bible, but it's not good to just lock yourself in your room and not go to an actual church. Come on. I understand there are people because of physical limitations. You can't do that. Understand, but the exception proves the rule. Amen. There are some people who do struggle with, they, they, they say, I just want to study the Bible. I just want to get so deep into these doctrines. And you see this especially 
with one the Calvinists, but then also if you run into hyper dispensationalists, especially on. online, those guys, I, I, I don't know what they do in their spare time besides just literally lock themselves in the room and then try to get some unique doctrine that only they understand and that yeah. they uh, are the only ones that have the truth on. Well, look, what that is, is that's an imbalance. Why aren't you going out soul winning? Why aren't you going out and actually sharing the gospel with other people? Right. Why aren't they the ones out there inviting people to church and trying to get people to actually hear the gospel? So unfortunately, there are a lot of people who think that it's okay to just not join a good church. And again, I understand there are churches that you might be in an area where there's not any good Bible-believing churches. But if you have, just like Pastor Kim says, even if it's a C-grade church, yeah. it's better than an F, which yeah. is your flesh. You sitting there in your flesh, letting that knowledge puff you up when you're not sharing the gospel with anybody. You're not ministering to the brethren because it's easy to focus on the lost world, which we should, but also think about ministering to the brethren. I know that a lot of Bible believers teach and think that precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ has to do with the souls one, and I agree with that, but think about the precious stones that exist here in the church with each other. Think about how you can minister to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. You don't think there's a reward in that, actually ministering to the body of Christ? That's another way that you can minister as well. So you don't want to go too far on that side, but then again, you don't want to just be going out there, inviting people to church. And again, I'm never going to discourage sharing the gospel with somebody, obviously. But what you unfortunately see, especially with the evangelical crowd, is too much going out and trying to reach people at the expense of teaching and doctrine. They don't want to hear about teaching, and they don't want to learn good doctrine because they say, well, all, all we really need to care about is just the souls. And I get it. Yeah, that's the most important thing. That's what we need to focus on. But then it's almost like you get saved and then nothing. Right. It's like 20 years, speaking kind of from personal experience here, growing up in churches where you learn a little bit by a little bit, but looking back, you really don't learn a whole lot of doctrine in those other churches. Why? Because there's an imbalance. Yes. So again, don't become imbalanced. The last place we'll turn to is Galatians 5. So go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5, and then look at verse 16. It says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So notice here, you have your flesh, which that, that's your body, that's your physical body, but it also includes your human spirit, the thoughts that you have. That stuff goes directly contrary to the Holy Spirit. So you can either give in to what your own human spirit wants to do, which is from your flesh, or you can yield to the Holy Spirit instead. So the key here is the only way to be balanced is yielding to the Holy Spirit. Don't yield to your human spirit, yield to the Holy Spirit, and that's the constant battle that we always struggle with. Okay, I already hit on most of the other stuff. Last couple of points that I'll say is, uh, so again, with understanding that there are people watching online as well, you see an imbalance, especially on the internet, because look at Pastor Kim's teaching videos and the number of views versus his preaching videos. Yeah, that's right. It's because when people go online, they're going because they want the knowledge, they want to get puffed up, they're just feeding their mind. But then why are they watching the preaching videos too? Come on, that's why? Right. Because that's hitting their heart. That actually affects how they live. They're actually going to have to yield and sacrifice some things, put it on the altar before the Lord, instead of just increasing a knowledge, not having to sacrifice anything. That's probably why people like teaching more than they like preaching. Come on, and again, I'm not saying that there isn't a place for, for teaching, but it needs to be balanced with yeah. preaching. So when you watch a teach, here's a practical challenge for all of us in here. When you watch a good teaching about the Bible, follow it up with a good preaching. Amen. Because if not, you're going to have that knowledge and it's going to puff you up. Yeah. And so that's why you need to have a balance. So question for everybody tonight, the preaching part is, are you imbalance tonight are you only leaning towards one side right now 
Was there a time where you were ever balanced with both? Or is all you want to do just get that knowledge and let it puff you up? Or maybe you're on the other side and you're here thinking, I don't really care about this doctrinal stuff. I'm just here for the fellowship. I'm just here for the spirit that's here, but I could care less about the doctrine. Well, guess what? You're also imbalanced. Come on. So are you imbalanced tonight? Do you need to spend more time on your heart instead of just your head? Notice, too, that the heart actually needs to be dealt with church, or needs to be dealt with first in the church. Sorry. So notice that Jesus, when he did his earthly ministry, he dealt with the hearts of the people first before he gave them the knowledge. So you need to get your heart right to get your doctrine straight. If you are starting to go off the rails in doctrine, or if you notice that someone you love or someone else is going off the rails with doctrine, it's because there's an issue with the heart. And then if somebody doesn't care about doctrine whatsoever, doesn't care about Bible teaching, that's also an issue with their heart right there. So I think that a lot of us, if we're honest, we, we like the, the knowledge. We like to increase in our Bible knowledge, and amen, praise the Lord, all for that. However, if we forget to balance that out with our heart, then we're going to be in a whole load of trouble, and the Lord's not going to be able to use us very well because we're not going to have charity edifying the brethren. We're not going to care about lost souls because we're just going to focus on sitting in our room and studying the Bible and watching YouTube videos all day. That's not going out and reaching people for the Lord. So, are you imbalanced tonight? If you are, just surrender that before the Lord, put that on the altar, and then yield to the Holy Spirit, which is the only thing, the Holy Spirit of God is the only thing that can keep you balanced. So, yield to Him, don't yield to your flesh, and stay balanced, just like the seven spirits of God. Amen. Amen. All right. Yeah, praise God. Good teaching. Amen. 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 All right. I can just go ahead and close in prayer. Yeah, Let's okay. do that. Yeah, Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the chance to teach and preach your word. And Father, I thank you for just the absolute just amount of riches that we can't even comprehend that are found in your word. Father, we thank you for giving us a perfect word with the King James Bible. Father, I thank you that we don't have to haggle and worry about what our, what our own interpretations are. We have your words right here in front of us. And so, Father, I thank you for giving us your perfect word, but, Father, I pray that in our study of your word and in our desire to grow closer to you and to the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would look at our own hearts and that we would put on the altar anything that gets in the way of our relationship with you and our ability to serve you. So, Father, I pray that this edifies the hearers and that you would please bless your word. Please bless everyone tonight. Give them a safe trip back home. And, Father, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.